we found these posters in a box and um, they hadn't been formally brought into the collection. And so uh, because of where our mission is interdisciplinary teaching, we decided to talk to some professors about whether they thought they would use them for their classes and they were really excited by them. And they're just interesting. They have so many different layers of information. There's you know, aesthetics, music, culture, history, um, and that they're all from one particular year. Almost, almost all the works of the exhibition were created in 1967. And so we thought this was a great opportunity to kind of give people a, a little visual slice of what it was like to be in San Francisco in 1967 through the lens of rock music, drugs, cultural events, um, and aesthetics. But a lot of it is just visual. It's like, is this work really going to make people uh, wonder about it? Are they going to want to really look at it? Are they going to want to learn more about it? So that often will drive what, uh, you know, what we'll choose to have in the exhibition. You know, these posters were really responsible for communicating information over a very wide uh, range of not only time but also space. So obviously this is a time period when there's no internet. And this is the way information was communicated. And that's always been really fascinating to me. I mean, I love prints. I think prints are one of my favorite uh, visual media. And, and to learn more about um, this particular time period through prints was, was really exciting. What was specifically um, interesting about this time in San Francisco was the sort of flowering of this new um, musical culture. So there were, um, you know, at this time, musical acts weren't playing in big stadiums. They weren't sort of playing to huge crowds. I mean, the, the Beatles played Shea Stadium in 1965, and that was extremely unusual. Mostly, um, you know, the, the musical acts would be, there would be you know, 12 bands on the venue, they'd each play a couple of songs, they'd play their one hit, and they'd get off. Um, but, you know, in San Francisco, um, there's this new musical culture that is um, flowering, and there were these couple of, of ballrooms that they, they did what they called dance concerts, um, the Avalon Ballroom and uh, the Fillmore Auditorium, and these ven were venues that could fit between 950 and 1200 people, so that's a fairly large venue. And they started to do these really interesting shows where they'd be mixing all these different styles of music. Um, they would be playing extended sets. And I think sort of the psychedelic turn in music is really um, characterized by you know, more improvisation, you know, longer sets, some, you know, real more focus on, on sort of live musical performance as well as different musical styles. So there's a lot happening in music during this time period. And I think, you know, San Francisco being sort of a small and concentrated city with these great venues and these two promoters that are really, um, you know, uh, pushing this sort of new um, way of, of listening to music. I mean, that was certainly extremely important. It's definitely something that has um, a lot of resonance with, with people of different generations um, today. Because I think there's a lot of interest in this time period because it, it has this very distinct um, place in American history and in American culture that people always think of, you know, the 1960s as, you know, free love and the summer of love. And this kind of brings, you know, makes it more concrete, kind of makes it, you know, grounds it within um, imagery and also in events. So hopefully that will kind of help people make those connections over time. They break all of the conventions of advertising. I mean, they, they, they don't in the sense that they're very eye-catching, but they do in the sense that a lot of the lettering is completely illegible that you know you couldn't tell what any of these said unless you looked really hard. But in some ways that's actually kind of a very smart um, a smart technique because it makes you linger, it makes you stop and really, really look at them. So just the interesting idea that these are, you know, these are advertisements, but at the same time they're sort of visually artistic in a way that that I don't think is really common anymore. So they are very um, they are very unique. People can learn a lot about um, a lot about music a lot about different cultural events, a lot about you know, aesthetics, a lot about the drug culture, um, but it's all layered. So I think that you know, all these things are connected, but they all are separate stories at the same time. Um, and, and for me, I think though that um, you know, the idea that, that art, in particular graphic art, can become part of, um, of, of daily life and daily culture um, is sort of an exciting message because, I mean, people think of posters as being, you know, something that's added for advertising or something you have on the wall, but they are sort of like living, breathing, active documents in lived experience. And, you know, we're really interested in the idea that, you know, life is not divorced from art. I mean, art is really sort of everywhere. So I think taking a common um, visual, 
thing like a poster and bring it into an art museum hopefully will help people look at art in a different way or look at you know the world around them in a different way.